When you think of Singapore's reserves, how many of you immediately imagined it to look something like this? All those savings locked up in a highly secure vault in a top secret location. Well, you may not be entirely wrong. For the first time on national TV, we aim to demystify the Singapore reserves and hopefully answer the question, just how much does this tiny island have? As a start, we trawl through the spreadsheets of every entity linked to the reserves. That's like trying to read an epic novel and starting from the last page. No wonder most Singaporeans give up trying to understand what makes up the reserves. So, we did the next best thing. We wrote to the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the country's central bank. After some negotiation, the Central Bank of Singapore granted the CNA team exclusive access to a vault but on the condition that we sign an undertaking to keep the location secret, as well as leave behind all devices with GPS tracking. And just so we don't leak out where our reserves are kept unintentionally, we offered to take this additional measure. And off we go. Does this room look familiar? Well, we've set it up to look just like it did over the last three years, when Singapore's ministers gave regular updates on the COVID-19 outbreak. This is uh, a lot of familiarity with this environment, and I see you have recreated it to be almost like what we had during the press conferences. I had to come here repeatedly. In 2020, when COVID started, we were still not quite sure how severe it was going to be. Then in March, things crystallised. We knew it was going to get quite bad and we needed additional measures. And by then, we had no more uh, fiscal resources. The government has obtained President's in principle support to draw up to $17 billion to fund some of the measures to save jobs and the economy. We needed to go to the President for reserves. The only alternative would have been to borrow, which is what most other countries do. When you borrow, you have great uncertainty. You don't know how much you can borrow, you don't know how markets will react, and therefore I think it would have impacted the swiftness and the decisiveness of our response. We were the first in Asia to get the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and the reserves played a critical role in enabling us to do so. I have no doubt that without the reserves, we would have ended up with more lives lost in COVID and certainly we would have ended up with a much higher unemployment. For most people in Singapore, the pandemic was the first time the reserves made a palpable difference to their lives. But while awareness increased, it unfortunately reinforces this impression that the National Reserves is an emergency piggy bank, something that's only useful during a national crisis. But in reality, these reserves do a whole lot more. Ten years ago, this $50 note could buy all this with some change to spare. But today, this would set you back about $10 more. This is an example of inflation, the rise in the price of goods and services over time. When an economy is doing well, people tend to spend more. And when firms see the increased demand, they will increase prices to maximize profits. So inflation uh, could rise as a result of very strong demand, but it could also rise because of rise in production costs, a shortage of supply, especially of imports. Central banks are responsible for keeping rising prices in check. And most do this by adjusting the interest rates. When interest rates are raised, borrowing money becomes more expensive. People tend to spend less, and businesses will lower their prices because of decreased demand. Unlike most other central banks, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, or MAS, manages the exchange rate instead. That's because Singapore is an open economy that's heavily dependent on trade. 
so the exchange rates have a bigger impact on prices than interest rates. For example, Singapore imports 90% of its food, like these nuts from Malaysia, and most of the fresh produce. Even the electricity used to power this freezer is generated from imported natural gas. This uh, packet of vegetables is from Malaysia. So if the Malaysian exporter wanted to charge three Malaysian ringgit for it, and if our exchange rate were three ringgit to a dollar, it would cost the Singapore importer a dollar. But should Singapore's exchange rate weaken to two ringgit to the dollar, it would cost 150 instead. Of course, the final price you pay includes other costs and markups. But a favourable exchange rate acts as a dampener on huge price increases. If there's a global shortage of um, the vegetables and the prices skyrocket, for example, then having a stronger exchange rate could help to moderate the price increase for Singaporeans. So without any adjustment of the exchange rate, um, we could see even high inflation in Singapore as a result of important inflation. You might be wondering how we control the exchange rate and what all this has got to do with Singapore's reserves. Well, Sydney has the answers. But just a minute, she's a little sleep deprived. She works in this very restricted part of Singapore's central bank that only a selected group of people have access to. We need face ID, fingerprint to be able to enter the dealing room because what we do is highly classified and involves large sums of money. It may look like an ordinary office, but this room is where up to billions of dollars are traded every day. When we are on duty, the job is 24 hours. Our job, in essence, is to defend the Sing dollar. But wait, before we get into why Sydney has to work around the clock, here's a little background. The Monetary Authority of Singapore, or MAS, is the country's central bank and the manager of the official foreign reserves. The OFR forms the core of the country's reserves. When you're buying and selling with countries around the world, you need all kinds of major foreign currencies. I think the bulk of it should be the US dollar, because this is very commonly used to settle international trade and of course other major currencies as well. For example, the Euro, Japanese Yen, Chinese Yen or the British Pound. That's why you often see the term foreign reserves when the news refers to a country's reserves. The OFR, which partly consists of cash and foreign currencies, is what MAS traders like Sing E gets to tap into. Sin E's job is essentially to keep the Sing dollar exchange rate right where the central bank wants it, or at least close to it. Think of it as a game of darts, except instead of just targeting the bullseye, MAS's aim is to keep the exchange rate within an optimal range between the Sing dollar and an undisclosed basket of currencies of Singapore's major trading partners. This exchange rate is called the Singapore Dollar Nominal Effective Exchange Rate, or Sing Near for short. It's allowed to fluctuate as long as it's within a secret safe zone or policy band known only to MAS. This prevents huge fluctuations in the exchange rate with our trading partners. If the Singnia is in danger of falling outside that safe zone, well, that's when Singi has to jump into action. I'm part of a team of MAS officers who monitor the Sing dollar exchange rate. We intervene in the market to ensure that the Singnia stays within the policy band and there's not too much volatility in the single exchange rate. In doing so, we accumulate or draw down on foreign reserves. Okay, we can't actually show her in action since the information on her computer screens is classified. So Sydney is offered to show us using a video game MA has created about her job. It's located right next to the main lobby to educate the public what it is that she does. So this is a simplified version of how I intervene in the foreign exchange market. So when the senior is approaching the top of the policy band, it would mean that the Sing dollar is too strong. That would make Singapore's exports more expensive and therefore less competitive. We will be intervening by selling the Sing dollar. And in doing so, we will be increasing the amount of official foreign reserves that we hold. And if it's approaching or exceeding the bottom of the band, it will mean that the Sing dollar is too weak. 
we will buy the Sing dollar back from the market using the official foreign reserves. In doing so, it will strengthen the Sing dollar. This keeps the cost of imported goods from getting too expensive. When key market events happen, US Sing dollar exchange rate will be very volatile. Say, for example, the Federal Reserve is announcing their rate decision. It happens at 2 3 a.m. in our Singapore time, and we will have to be awake if needed to intervene in the market. To facilitate these money operations, MAS holds between 65 and 75 percent of Singapore's GDP in foreign reserves at any one point. As of mid 2023, this amounted to more than 300 billion US dollars. Now, this isn't just in the form of cash in foreign currencies. And while this sounds like a lot of money, it isn't all the reserves that Singapore has. In Singapore, the value of every single dollar is managed by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. This ensures that the purchasing power of every dollar is kept stable. It does this by using the country's foreign reserves, which consists partly of foreign currencies. For many countries, their reserves go beyond just foreign currencies. Countries like Norway and the United States, their reserves also include natural resources like oil and other precious minerals in the ground. But Singapore has no natural resources. What it has is gold. Now this isn't part of Singapore's national gold reserves. It actually comes from a vault run by this guy. No, he's not from the government, but he's very interested in tracking the gold that the Singapore government owns. The largest purchases of gold are central banks and governments all across the world. So it's important to track what the largest players in the market are doing. So MAS publishes a monthly report. If you look up the section Official Reserve Assets, you'll find a line for gold. As of mid-2023, that's around 7 million fine troy ounces, which is equivalent to 222 tonnes of gold. How much is that? Luke's team is going to help us visualize it. After three hours, the team finally stacked up one ton of gold. What? That's it? Now I know this doesn't look like much. Um, we get that a lot from first time buyers. Um, you know, that's it. That's one kilo of gold. But if you think about it, it's because gold is very dense. Um, and so something like that could buy you a second-hand car in Singapore. And over here, we have the 400-ounce gold bar. And this would comfortably buy two five-room HDB flats here in Singapore. Imagine this stack multiplied by 222. That's how much MAS is currently holding. Gold worth at least 10 billion Singapore dollars as of mid-2023. Remember that super secretive trip we took at the start of this show? Here's where we were brought to. And this is the gold that belongs to Singapore. No media outlet has ever been granted access before. Each tray you see holds up to 20 gold bars, and each bar is worth close to 800,000 US dollars. And this vault, the size of which we can't disclose, is filled with these trays. This is just some of the gold Singapore has accumulated since the nation first bought gold in 1968. Gold's true value really shines during times of uncertainty and times of crisis. During times of crisis, the value of the other reserve assets will tend to fall. 
Gold has been tested across centuries, across thousands of years, and has still proven to be a good store value. Singapore bought its first 100 tons of gold at 40 US dollars per ounce. The price today is close to 2,000 US dollars per ounce. The gold is part of our foreign reserves. The official foreign reserves managed by the central bank includes foreign currency, bonds and shares in companies, and commodities like the gold you just saw. Singapore is not unlike a successful businessman who has started to accumulate some savings. And after a while, he would think about how to grow the savings rather than just leave it in cash. MAS is not the only entity managing our reserves. The other two being GIC Private Limited and Tomasic Holdings. Both are state-owned, but run separately from the government to focus on growing the national reserves. And GIC and Tomasic have uh, different investment strategies. So GIC is the government's fund manager, a slightly more conservative investor than uh, Tomasic. Tomasic is a pure equities investor. It would take on higher risk, but also that would allow it to achieve higher expected returns. We could explain the different risk appetites using a game of football. Tomasic invests mainly in equities and even startups. Higher risks, but higher returns. That's akin to having five strikers, but two defenders. It's an attack-minded approach, designed to score more and generate higher returns, but taking more risks with fewer defensive assets. GIC has more defensive assets than Tomasic, and hence less aggressive on the attack, taking less risk in the pursuit of returns. Regardless of the different risk appetites, both entities invest for the long haul. For them, it's the performance for an entire season that matters, rather than the scoreline of a specific match. Charmaine is, well, you can consider her something like a football team manager with the GIC. In the last 11 years, I have been quite successful in not telling anyone how much I manage at the GIC. When I do mention how much I manage, they will normally say, wait, was that in millions or billions? And um, I will just sort of smile and uh, <laughs> I am an investor who is constantly on the hunt for good and hopefully very good investments that we can own for the long term. To ensure Charmaine and her bosses do their jobs properly, GIC has a board of directors like any other big fund managers. But their board has a chairman, quite unlike any other. He's arguably the most famous man in Singapore. Few in Singapore can claim to know as much about the reserves as this man. Make you up? Yeah, sure. Meet the chairman of the GIC board. And of course, he's the Prime Minister of Singapore too. GIC's mandate is purely to manage our reserves, to make them grow and to protect them in downturns. My job is to be there so that there's political accountability, so that uh, the markets will know and the GIC team will know that the GIC board makes decisions on behalf of the government. In other companies, the board actually goes into individual investment decisions. In GIC's case, the board doesn't go into individual investment decisions. The board sets the overall mandate, the risk limits and the strategy it chooses the key people and the professionals and there are other governance committees within GIC who then do the actual investments. If you have a competent team, if you have an honest team, if you give them the right mandate and mission and you have the right governance process, you can be reasonably sure that the reserves will grow and GIC has shown that.
Over the years, the GIC has been buying investments that have a chance to really grow in value over time. This is from Shakey's Pizza, a mega pizza chain that is making some serious dough in the Philippines. Companies like Shakey's can slice themselves into smaller shares. Through GIC, Singapore has bought 16.8% of shares in the company that runs this pizza chain in the Philippines. So, when the pizza company profits, Singapore receives a portion of the wealth. And as the pizza company grows, so does Singapore's share. GIC can keep these funds for further growth or sell them off for a profit, with all proceeds flowing back into Singapore's reserves. So what other companies has Singapore invested in through GIC? Starbucks. But not the one in Singapore. Through GIC, Singapore's reserves has a 32.5% stake in Starbucks Korea. Over in Europe, Singapore has invested in the Sunny Ecos Group which runs luxury resorts in the Mediterranean. Singapore even has a stake in Ancestry, a multi-billion dollar American genealogy company. But why invest in all these companies that are so far away from Singapore? Like any good investor, we try not to put all eggs in one basket, and therefore we have investments all over the world. So for example, if there's a downturn specific to Asia, maybe the investments in Europe and North America may still be doing well. GIC doesn't just diversify geographically. They also invest in different types of assets rather than just shares of companies. GIC buys into bonds, which works like a loan to a company or even country, and this generates a percentage interest. The country's sovereign wealth fund also invests in real estate. These assets can appreciate in value, generate an income or do both and the proceeds flow back into Singapore's reserves. Since GIC's mandate is to invest outside of Singapore, we called upon these Singaporeans, all living abroad, and gave them a task. They have to locate a building in their cities that Singapore has a stake in. towards Emporium. It's right opposite the Melbourne Central train station, making it very easy to get to. As you can see, it is quite busy for a Friday afternoon here in Melbourne. Right behind me here is Ajat invested by Singapore itself. And here the location is extremely good as well. You can even see the Oriental Pearl Tower. So I've been to Paddington Station many times to catch the train, but I've never actually been to this place, which is called Paddington Central. So as you can see, the building behind me is actually Gangnam Finance Centre. It's actually one of Seoul's largest buildings, and it's 204 metres tall. The building is pretty massive compared to the other buildings around it. I actually wasn't aware that Broadgate London was partially owned or invested in by Singapore. These are five major international properties. But through GIC, Singapore has invested in over 30 cities globally. GIC is one of two entities managing the reserves, but it's often Tamasic that hawks the headlines, sometimes for the wrong reasons. We showed some of the online barbs to the folks at Tamasic, minus those not safe for work, of course. Comment number one, Tamasic lost millions of dollars on failed investments. Mm. So I get questions about Tamasic's uh, investment performance, even for my family and friends. And I think it's important to understand that every investment carries with it um, certain inherent risks. 
and we also have a dynamic component that future oriented. We do not look at, for example, focusing on one uh, investment or two investments. We really look at portfolio as a whole. For us, I think it's very important to ensure that we are delivering sustainable returns over the long term. We are not affected by the short term spike or the short term trough that you know, gets everybody too excited. GIC is a slightly more conservative investor than uh, Tamasek. Tamasek is a pure equities investor, uh, so it would take on higher risk, have the most volatile portfolio, but at the same time, uh, its returns are generally higher than GIC. Tamasic's focus on equities can be traced to its founding in 1974 to take over ownership of 35 companies that were originally started and managed by the government. Some names you might know. Singapore Telephone Board. Now, Singtel. Call waiting. Another lifestyle service from Singapore Telecom. Sal, have you seen mum? Singapore Airlines. Great way to fly. DBS Bank. The companies themselves started off in the early years of our independence. The government had to go in and start many companies because otherwise there was nobody who was doing that. We created the shipyards when the British left Keppel and Zambawang. We had Malaysia Singapore Airlines when we were inside Malaysia. After we split from Malaysia, after some time the airline also split up and then we formed SIA. DBS was actually started off a financing piece of EDB and then that grew and it split off, it became a bank. So in the early years, the line between being a company and being the government was not quite so sharp as now. But I think that was the reason why in 1974, uh, the ministers then, I suppose Dr Go, Hon Sui Sen, Lim Kim San, uh, decided to take all these government companies out of the ministries which are overseeing them, create the Masik Holdings and put them into Masik Holdings, separate from the ministries, one remove. So that two things. One, we don't ask the companies for favours. Two, the company doesn't ask the ministry for favours. I'm a GLC, I have this problem, I need some government support, can you give me some special arrangements? Which happens in so many countries. Beyond wanting it to be in one place and somewhat arm's length, actually, Tomasi had a role too, to rationalise what they were holding, the companies which no longer made sense for the government to own, you sold off companies which are no longer viable, make sure that they were wound up and dealt with some way, companies with promise, we would grow them, and nurture them. New areas where you were not in and to go into, to choose those new areas and grow a portfolio diversified, Singapore, in the Asian region, and in the developed world. To grow its portfolio, Tamasic has been divesting a part of its 100% stake in the government-linked companies that it owns. It does this by selling some of their shares to the public on the stock exchange. This sale generates cash. Tamasic can take that cash to invest in more shares, but this time into companies around the world to generate better returns. Yes, that's the online gaming platform Roblox right there. That part of growing Tamasic to what it is now really started in earnest in 1996 when I asked Mr. Dana Balan to become the chairman of Tamase, and he went in and he built up Tamase's headquarters, holdings, the management at Tamase, and they started working on the portfolio. And you can see the record from 1996 until now. Tamase has done well. So with thousands of assets spread around the world, just how large are Singapore's national reserves? If I had to tell you our asset base on national TV, I would be in trouble. <laughs> we don't actually know because the actual figure is not published. I think the, the number of people who know the full value is quite limited. And here's one of them. I'm sure you are dying to ask that question. Well, I can't tell because 
we look at our reserves as part of our national security, not unlike our critical military capabilities. And we don't go around telling the world what our military capabilities are. Why should we? One of those serious threats is speculative attacks on the Singapore dollar. Wait, how do you even attack a currency? This is how. Speculators can drive down the value of the Singapore dollar by aggressively selling it in the currency market. When this happens, your currency is worth less. But you can defend yourself by buying back the Singapore dollar and basically neutralizing the efforts of these speculators. And that's what the foreign currencies and assets held in the reserves can be used for. And if Singapore lets everybody know exactly how much reserves it has, it's a bit like telling the world exactly what it has in its arsenal. And as long as an enemy has more than Singapore, they know it's safe to pick a fight. So, strictly speaking, the size of Singapore's reserves is a state secret. Or is it? The reserves are not as secret as some people may think they are. In fact, I can, I can check what is the amount um, that MES manages as well as the portfolio value of Tamasic Holdings. Let me take a look. As at 31st March this year, the official foreign reserves managed by MES were 416 billion Singapore dollars, while Tamasic's portfolio value was 382 billion dollars. So these are two of the three major components of financial reserves which are already publicly disclosed. It's just that one component, the amount managed by GIC, is not fully disclosed. All the government has said is that GIC manages well in excess of 100 billion US dollars. But the reserves that the government holds um, comprise not just financial assets, but also um, land and buildings in Singapore. There are white bungalows, disused schools, shop houses, Old Kalang Airport, the Gilman Barracks and Dempsey. Kerry is from Singapore Land Authority, which manages 2,700 state properties and 11,000 hectares of state land. That's about 15% of Singapore's total land size. When I go out with my friends, I also try to bring them to our state property uh, to dine so that they actually can appreciate what I do and how these state properties are now transformed into a lifestyle, a destination for everyone to enjoy. So, is everything government-linked part of the reserves? I've just brought out my own printout of the uh, Constitution of the Republic of Singapore. If you wonder why this guy walks around with the Singapore Constitution in his bag, well, he teaches constitutional law at NUS Law School. But what has a lawyer got to do with the nation's wealth? Our constitution is rather unusual in the sense that uh, most other constitutions around the world, nobody actually tries to define what reserves are. And, and for good reason, right? Because most governments actually like to keep the idea fluid because uh, that, that gives them much flexibility. So by putting the meaning of uh, the reserves into the constitution, the idea is to safeguard it from anyone wanting to tamper with the reserves. So, what's being protected? Well, here's the fifth schedule. It's a list of exactly which statutory boards and government companies are involved in Singapore's reserves. You will see some familiar names we've mentioned this episode. There are some deletions. This one here used to be MND Holdings Private Limited, which was deleted in 2016 because it ceased to exist. And this used to be the Board of Commissioners of Currency Singapore and got removed when it merged with MAS. So why is HDB and JTC on the list? Don't they just develop housing and industrial estates? In Chinese, there's a phrase, bian mai dian dang. If you are desperate, what do you do? What you have, you convert it, you sell it, you pledge it, you pawn it. Whatever it is, you convert it, take cash and spend the cash. And what we wanted to do was to catch all the things which could be converted, which could be sold, which could be pledged, which could be pawned. And it's basically 
financial assets, companies, and land. Then, where are these things which can be pledged and sold? So, financial items, MAS, of course, has money. The Masse, of course, has got companies, and that readily can be converted to money. The GIC manages money. And then you have the CPF money, which is Singaporeans' savings. It's not really the government's money, but if the government is not completely straight with you, they could do something there, and that money can be at risk. So those things have to be covered. Then you have the land. Who has the land? JTC has the land, because you have big pieces of Singapore which are industrial estates, land, land to be developed, land which has been reclaimed. And then you have HDB, because HDB has also got factory land. HDB has got land which is people's houses. And that also is a valuable financial asset. So therefore, we ended up with six so-called Schedule 5 entities. So, yes, the CPF is protected as one of the fifth Schedule entities. In fact, the CPF retirement accounts of every Singaporean is tied to the fate of the reserves, far more than most people realise. The guaranteed interest rates for the CPF are a key part of our CPF system. And it's a system that works only because of our reserves. If we were to move to a different system, let the CPF member take their own risk. You have people who retire, let's say, during the global financial crisis. It will be terrible for their retirement or anyone who has retired in the last three years when markets were impacted and had such great volatility, they would have been impacted too. So regardless of the ups and downs in the market, we continue to pay the same guaranteed interest rate to CPF members. The CPF money that you and your employer contribute every month is actually invested in something called Special Singapore Government Securities Bonds. Think of it as an IOU for your CPF money, with not just a money-back guarantee, but added interest. Imagine this coin is that money loaned. The money gets deposited into Singapore Central Bank and mixed in with other government funds. The bulk of this larger pool of money then gets passed on to the country's sovereign wealth fund, the GIC, to invest. The returns on these investments add to Singapore's reserves, which helps the government pay the guaranteed interest in years when investment returns aren't as good. Sometimes we think that the reserves are there only for future emergency, but in fact, the reserves are also an endowment providing for today's needs, and all of us are benefiting from it right now. And one of the most concrete ways the reserves are benefiting everyone in Singapore comes in the form of one of the island's most ambitious projects yet. Tourists in Singapore marvel at the glittering cityscapes and iconic landmarks. But these buildings and many others in Singapore would not have existed if not for land reclamation. Everything on the left of us used to be sea. This is all reclaimed land. This bungalow, sandwiched between condominiums and shopping malls, used to sit right on the beach. And across the road, where the sea once was... Victoria Junior College, that's where I went to school. So this is Marine Terrace. That's where I used to stay. So it was really very close to VJC. It was just a walking distance away. There's lots of fond memories growing up here uh, because my formative years were all in Marine Parade. So whether it's the Marine Parade Library down the road, um, the Hawker Centre and the Neighbourhood Centre nearby, going to Parkway Parade later on when it came up, these were things that I grew up with. 
Marine Parade is Singapore's first public housing estate built on reclaimed land, so it was something quite special at that time. My parents would tell me that people were very concerned in those days that this land would sink and they weren't very sure whether to buy Marine Parade uh, flats. But they all lived in the east at that time, my mother in particular, her, her side of the family. So when she and my dad got married, the flats here were available and made sense for them to get flats here. The East Coast Reclamation was Singapore's first major post-independence reclamation project, adding 1,525 hectares to Singapore's southeastern coast and reshaping the city skyline. This new land created space for East Coast Park, an expressway connecting the east to the city, and yes, the landmarks at Marina Bay that have become icons of Singapore. And in the near future, reclaimed land is set to take Singapore's ambitions as an aviation hub to new heights. This is where we will be building the new Changi Airport Terminal 5. As you can see, it's a huge piece of land. So P5 will be bigger than all the terminals in Changi Airport today. Today, we see throughput at Changi Airport coming back to pre-COVID levels and we expect demand to increase considerably over the coming years. And that's why we are now building new capacity through Terminal 5 to make sure that we can continue to secure Singapore's position as a global aviation hub. The cost of reclaiming land at East Coast and here at Changi East were covered by Singapore's operating budget, which would include funds collected from taxes. But since 2001, land reclamation has been paid for using the country's past reserves. And that's how Singapore's biggest ongoing reclamation project on the other end of the island at Tuas is funded. On this land, Singapore is building the world's largest fully automated port, further boosting Singapore's position as a global shipping hub. The use of past reserves is very helpful because land reclamation projects are costly and we can only see the benefits over the long term. Without the use of past reserves for land reclamation, we would likely end up borrowing or using our own current resources. That would certainly be a bit of a constraint. But we should not get a mistaken idea that this is a draw on reserves because when we use past reserves, to create new land, the land is also protected as past reserves. And when we create the land and eventually sell the land for development, those land proceeds goes back to the reserves again. So from that point of view, it's uh, really just a conversion of assets. In Singapore, proceeds for all land sales are returned to the reserves. And these reserves are invested to generate returns. Half of these returns are locked away, kept for a rainy day. The other half that can be used for public spending is known as Net Investment Returns Contribution, or NIRC. In 2022, NIRC amounted to more than 22 billion Singapore dollars. Every year, the NIRC accounts for one-fifth of government revenues. It's about the same as corporate income tax revenues is 1.4 times personal income tax revenues. It's 1.3 times GST revenues. It's more money than we spend on any ministry. More money than we spend on defence. More money than we spend on education. More money than we spend on health. So some of the $22.4 billion from last financial year's NIRC went toward paying for sheltered walkways like these, new polyclinics and the subsidies for patients, and even the greenery we enjoy. We run a structural deficit in our primary fiscal balance of about 3 plus percent of GDP. That gap is covered by the NIRC. It's something that, you know, is very important. We dug up the budget statements from the last decade. They reveal that the Singapore government spent more than it raised in revenue for the last 10 years. And in eight of those years, the top-up from the NIRC rescued it from being in the red. 
if we didn't have the NIRC, then we have to cut back almost 3% of GDP of spending. That's a lot. It will mean less public housing for Singaporeans. It will mean less infrastructure. Our trains, our buses, we'll have to cut back on services. This is tightening of the belt to an extent that no one has ever felt before. Supposing you didn't have NIRC, contribution from the reserve, you can make it up, double your corporate income tax, or more than double your personal income tax. So instead of 21%, you'll be charging maybe 42% at the top. Or you can push up your GST. By how much? By 10 percentage points. Instead of 9%, next year, it will have, been, have to be 19%. Yet, as important as the reserves are to the smooth running of Singapore, there was once upon a time when the country nearly lost large chunks of it. If not for the intervention of one unconventional thinker, unafraid to step on a few toes.